This is a University of Otago podcast. I, I'd like to welcome Gary, Gary Nixon, here from the um, Postgraduate Rural, Pro Rural Program. And he'll, I know you'll have some wonderful slides to show us, of beautiful places, and talking, and will talk to us about the beautiful places that he and his team and his students work and live. Over to you, Good. Gary. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, uh, tēnā koutou koutou. Uh, th thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you. I would probably would really enjoyed um, having uh, had the opportunity to, to spend a couple of days here. Um, but uh, we're trying to uh, sort of put uh, forward an HRC bid and really busy the, the, last, the last week. And, and the other reason that the rest of the team who want a person particularly who should be doing this is, is, is tied up is that we're quite involved now in the Pacific um, and we've actually got a meeting on in Rarotonga and that sort of dragged people away in slight preference to, to come in here but, so, but I wouldn't be offended by that. But, uh, so so that, that's where the rest of them are um, and I've been left home this, this time which, uh, which, which is a wee bit of, wee bit of a shame. I, I'm um, very much a rural clinician. I work at um, Dunstan Hospital in Clyde in central Otago. Um, it was about 30 kilometres away from where I grew up and it's the only place I've, I've ever worked. Um, so that's very much my home um, and I'm just a very occasional visitor to the, to the university, um, even though um, in more recent years half my, half my job has been university work. Uh, the person I work most um, closely with is the other person who's a senior lecturer on this program is Cardi Blattner and, and Cardi's based in the Hokianga. Uh, and uh, Cardi's um, put together this this um, presentation, and, and these are these are her slides. Um, so I've sort of I've, I've borrowed it largely largely from her. So immediately that probably tells you that things are a little bit different for us. Um, I would see Cardi perhaps two to three times during the year, um, and I would see the rest of my team members only once a year. Um, but we're still in very close contact and, we, and it works, works very well together. The, the program that we're involved with is um, the Rural Postgraduate Program and it has two qualifications nowadays. Um, one is a um, postgraduate diploma for doctors working in small hospitals and in remote um, general practice around the country and the other qualification is this one here which uh, involves teaching doctors uh, how to do clinician performed ultrasound which as you can imagine is very pertinent for those of us working in rural areas where we have quite limited access to diagnostics but interestingly this program has become very popular now with emergency physicians and anaesthetists and intensivists and stuff um, and in fact, the institution which sends most doctors to this program is actually Middlemore Hospital, uh, even though it's a program taught by rural generalists. So, okay. so rem remote and rural health. This is, these, like I say, slides from the Hokianga. It is, it is a recognised now interna internationally as a, as a discipline um, in its own right. And the features of that discipline are of obviously of professional isolation, of obviously of geographic isolation, have limited resources, particularly around diagnostics and accesses to specialist treatment and services. Rural communities are different, and living in them is different. Uh, I must say, I, I find it's absolutely an enormous, enormous pleasure and privilege to do so, but it requires certain sort of techniques to live and work in those communities. But the biggest feature of all is around generalism. So as the rest of medicine has very much moved to much more specialised models, we still cover a very, very broad scope of practice. And the feature of it is that when someone turns up with a problem is you can never say, no, this is not part of my scope, go and see someone else. I mean, you can, you can sort of, you have to at least initially deal with it. So that generalism is, is the biggest feature of our, our scope. Okay. The context. I mentioned that we're doing an HRC bit at the moment. 
the, this is actually all around this question. I, it's recognised internationally that people in rural, living in rural areas have poor health, health outcomes, as well, obviously, as poor access to services. But it's actually not really re well recognised in New Zealand, and that's largely because the research has never been done. And you would think that it would be. But um, certainly wherever it's been done in Western countries, it's been shown very clearly. Okay. The, um, there, there is also some pretty good evidence too that if you improve particularly the generalist services in those communities, then you can come over, uh, overcome some of those disparities. Okay. And then there's this question which obviously involves us all the time. And, and this recognition that if we want to treat, if we want to train doctors for rural practice, we're going to have to do it in a, in a different sort of, um, and pretty innovative, innovative sort of way. We really have to do it in a way which allows them to continue in their day-to-day -day rural practice, um, as well as, as doing their rural specific training. Okay, and obviously it has to be um, distance learning. It's not a sort of an and or, it can only in this case be distance learning. Okay. History. In 2000, particularly in the area that I work of small hospital um, work, the, the workforce is in an absolute crisis. So something like 40% of the jobs were vacant. Um, about 70% of the people working in, who were there were international medical graduates. And there was something like an 80% turnover of staff every two years or something like that. So terrible statistics. Much worse than urban general practice and, uh, and much worse probably than, than any, of the, any of the specialties. And there's a, there was one year in the late 90s where I was the only person, I was the only medical qualified person working in the institution where I was one winter. Okay. The, the first step towards sort of trying to create, uh, fix that was um, Pat Farry, who's a very famous rural medical academic, put together the dipl this diploma that I now work on in 2002. So it was actually the university that made the first steps to, try over, try to overcome this workforce problem, rather than the other way around. Okay. Where there was quite strong links formed with movements which were occurring overseas, particularly in Australia. And ACRIM is the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. In 2006 is when the, uh, the um, ultrasound diploma got up and going. And then in 2008, we caught up on the vocational side. So in 2008, the Medical Council recognised rural practice, particularly rural hospital practice, as a separate scope of vocational practice, as, as a separate specialty in effect. And that happened in 2008. So that's quite interesting. So it was in the university process in the end, which created the community, which then resulted in a new vocational scope. And that's pretty unusual. And to this day, the university qualification is still a very important part of the specialist qualification. It provides the overarching academic component of that specialist training. And more recently, um, there's a, clearly a very similar need within isolated and remote communities overseas, and the, and the Pacific's very much a, a point in case. Uh, and there is no specific um, rural training um, in, in, the, in the islands. And, and so we've started to de develop, uh, in, in, in conjunction with some of the, the Pacific Islands, um, a, a collaboration which has allowed them to create their own training programs, but use what the components of our training program and our qualification that they think are useful for them. And that process is uh, very much underway now with the Cook Islands uh, and is just starting with Tonga and with Samoa. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to run through these very quickly. This, these are the particular university papers, although it's a, um, uh, a generalist scope. 
we've got to divide it up. Uh, and, and we divide it up along these lines. So each of these are either 15 or 30 point papers that we teach. But the th two things are done concurrently. So over the four year specialist training, while they're out doing their training runs, either in, in rural communities or they have to do some base hospital runs as well, the, the, the university is providing this overarching series of papers they take over that time. Okay. How it works. I know this will be very familiar to everybody, won't it? I mean, and it's, it's probably a bit of a theme. Would it be fair to say that these are the, the things that are, that are used? And I uh, probably, uh, probably don't need to explain that any, any further. Okay. So, so Moodle. Now, we probably do use Moodle a little bit different. Um, and I sort of try to explain it in the sense that when um, junior doctors are learning their specialty, there is a huge amount of interaction that goes on all the time um, in ward rounds, during morning tea, during lunch, where they're discussing their clinical work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a very important sort of learning process that they're doing with each other. Now, when our guys are isolated, so it's sort of Moodle that has to act act in that way. So the Moodle discussion is their opportunity to discuss amongst themselves their clinical work on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess in that sense, Moodle is a, a little bit different. That's where we put up our, um, all our readings and our assignments and that sort of thing as well. But it does have this other very important role of acting like the tea room. Okay. And you can sort of see See that sort of thing that's carrying, that's uh, you know continuing on, where where people are actually discussing their clinical work on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, Zoom. Now we, we sort of think that probably Zoom is our biggest contribution to the university. We, we tried everything. We were using audio conferences. It was a breaking the bank. It was far too expensive. Um, and and it, and and as our class size grew from sort of you know from five people, like it was, to 20 people where it is now, audio conference was just a disaster. And so we did try everything. We tried Skype. We tried, tried Otago Connect. Um, and we tried um, Scopia. And nothing would work in our context, largely because of the really poor, poor broadband. Um, it would just, just perpetually fell over. And then it was a chance sort of suggestion from some Americans who said, well, there's this new one you should, which is really good at poor, poor bandwidth, it's very intuitive, you should try using Zoom. So we started using it, using its free version, and then Jeff Ormanby got involved and started supporting it a bit, and now it's sort of been rolled out to the entire university, hasn't it? And, and I mean, I, I, obviously it sounds like you guys appreciate it as well, but it's been fantastic for us. It's really good. So, you know, we've got people here sort of, you know, in, in, the, in the Cook Islands, sort of. Tariki, sort of, he's sitting in, uh, in, in, uh, in Rarotonga at the time and spread out all across New Zealand. Um, and sometimes the, the, the tutor who's involved can be in Australia. Uh, and it just works, works fantastically well. We're really pleased with it. And it saved us a lot of money too. Okay. But, but we can't get away from this. Um, we do need to get, we do still do need the residentials. Um, and it's been a little bit hard to argue on a cost basis o over time. Um, but these guys really need the opportunity to come together. And when they do come together, we pro provide a formal program, which is largely very much a case-based sort of program. But there's a whole, it's so obvious when they come together, there's a whole heap of stuff going on um, that's outside that formal stuff. Because this is the, you know, there's one time where they get together as a group. Um, and and it'll be terrible to take that away. There's a whole heap of learning um, which is informal because they never see each other until those particular residential times. So those, those weeks are very, busy, uh, very important. We have cut them down to one residential per paper to try and reduce the costs. Um, but for a 30-point paper now, that can be reasonably long residential, like the next one I've got is for six days, um, and reasonably intensive. Okay. Uh, I've already, already mentioned that. 
uh, we make the residentials very much case-based, so we try not to teach new knowledge at the, unit, at the residentials. That's all done with the set readings and things. Um, and a lot of, lot of the work is very much um, uh, very practical cases in the rural context that we get them to get work together in small groups, generating management plans, which we then um, go through with one of us or with a, with a specialist. The, the residentials are not always in the city. Um, we try to put at least some of them into the, into the, um, to the rural context. Probably the residential that is the highlight of our program is the one which we ha uh, hold in the Hokianga. Um, it runs for about five days. Um, there's a particular community in uh, Marae who's ad largely adopted us. Uh, and and we, we, we've been going there for, for more than 10 years now. Um, and it is very much the people in that community and the place that does the teaching for that particular residential. It's, it's, it's very important. Okay. So what are, what, why do we think it works and what are the important things? Well, there is this, the distance learning side of it. It just wouldn't be possible if we, uh, if we didn't do it, in, do it that way. Okay. But then, not only have we got a, a very dispersed student body, our faculty is entirely dispersed as well too. So our faculty are based in the Hokianga, in um, Kaukaua, in Hawara, in Westport, Greymouth, Ashburton, Queenstown and Dunstan. Um, and, and it's that very dispersed faculty um, which m means that we run a credible program because we're all working day to day in that context. And I think both Cardi and I would say that the very important thing that we bring with us to this thing is the communities that we bring with us as well. It, it is still very important to have the connections with the specialists and the, uh, and the larger hospital and the larger universities. Uh, I, I don't think the specialists realise how consciously we use their input and manipulate their input. Um, they're fantastic resources and they know, they know huge amounts, but the thing with specialists is they don't know what part of what they know that we need to know. Uh, and that's a very important job for us in, in terms of getting from them um, what's, what's the useful information that they need to impart. And we've developed quite a few techniques of doing that. Okay. Um, our papers aren't just for the trainees. They're not just for the young doctors. They're very much open to doctors who are working in the scope um, who may be well through their careers and I want to use this as an ongoing education um, exercise as well too. And we really encourage that. I mean, our, um, uh, uh, our small group teaching and things is much, much better if some of those quite experienced doctors are sitting in those small groups at the same time. Um, they sometimes feel that they're a bit behind on the knowledge front, but what they can terms in, bring in terms of judgment and experience is, is enormous, and the whole group seriously benefits from that. That's sort of where our students are spread, as you can see, very dispersed. Okay. And nowadays, uh, more and more spread across the Pacific as well. Okay. Um, I already touched on the, the ultrasound um, program very briefly. It is actually makes up almost half of our teaching program. It is, it is quite important to us. Um, and like I say, it, it's not just teaching rural guys now, it's teaching a lot of, a lot of uh, urban doctors. Uh, that's taught uh, with three residentials over the year, um, and one of which is in central Otago. So, okay. I've got 10 minutes to go, so okay, right. 11, okay, good, good. Should probably touch on the Cook Islands experience as well, because that's, and that's been um, been a fantastic experience for us. 
uh, and, and it's been a real tremendous addition to, to the group. Um, it, but it, it does bring its own challenges. There's very different systems, medical systems, that th these guys are working in. Um, the, it's very much their program, uh, and they take from us what components of our program they, want, they find useful. It's a collaboration that very much involves the College of General Practitioners, us and the Cook Islands as well. Um, they, interestingly, they don't like the word rural. Um, for, for them, it's, it's and, and in a sense it's not, because they're sort of in Rarotonga, for them they're in the city um, a, lot of, a lot of the times. Um, but it, the, the conditions that they're working under are very similar to rural practice in New Zealand. I'm just going to work through these a little bit. The res residentials are probably even more important for this group, and they travel to New Zealand for the residential workshops. Okay. It, it, it gives them a, an inter international peer group, and they maintain those connections with those New Zealand doctors quite long term. Okay. Um, the stories they can tell and the, the clinical cases they bring are just a whole level in terms of remoteness and, and probably, a, probably a, quite a good reminder for those of working in rural New Zealand that uh, we think we have it hard, but we don't really have it hard. Uh, and this event which is occurring next week in Rarotonga is a, I mean, it's a really important uh, and fantastic experience which really brings the doctors from, from the two countries together. And that's, that's from a couple of years ago. Okay. There are challenges. Okay. That, we, that we face. And, th and this is definitely, definitely a challenge. The, the university is very much set up for people on the main campus. You know, you sort of feel like you're, you've got a little bit of a disability that you're aware of, but the rest of the, everybody else around you is not quite aware of and, and not quite the, aware of the challenges associated with that. Okay. We find that we can communicate with each other as a team very, very effectively because everybody is in the same footing, but communicating with us, back with the central university is, can be harder. Um, it's, a, a video conference is very easy when everybody is on video conference. A video conference is very hard where everybody is sitting in the room except for one distant or two distant participants. I think we all know that. Okay. When Dunedin got its sort of, you know, status as sort of giga city or whatever like that, everybody, everybody was probably delighted in Dunedin, and the rest, but the rest of us out there thought, oh no, that sort of means the divide's going to be even greater. So they're going to put even more things into place in Dunedin that won't work where we are. So that, that divide is, is, is quite a problem, I think. Okay. Um, also, it's not usual amongst the specialties to tie in an academic program and a vocational program either. That, uh, that's, that, uh, that's unusual in New Zealand. It does happen overseas, but in New Zealand it's unusual. I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll try and race through this fairly quickly. Okay. Um, the, I've already mentioned the, the, the technology, but, but it, at the same time, it is offering huge opportunities, and I'm sure what we were doing would not have been possible um, you know, 15 years or so, or so ago. Okay. Um, we think based on some recent evidence that what we're doing is making a difference. There was a recent survey done, the Rural Hospital Workforce, um, about a year ago, and it showed considerable improvement from what it had been um, eight or nine years ago. And, you know, sort of, you know, like, I think it was about eight years ago, something like 85% of rural hospital managers said there was a dire workforce shortage, and now, sort of, you know, 60% say there's a serious workforce shortage, so it's, it, it, is, it is an improvement. Okay. Um, we, we, are, we are growing rapidly. I mean, that's our EFTS. We've got a, so we'll have close to 150 students enrolled in papers next year. And, 
and that's that's been a challenge. It's been quite a challenge for us, and probably a, a challenge within a university that overall is relatively static in terms of its student numbers. It probably would have been easier to grow at a time when the whole university was growing. But if you're the one part of it that's growing, then it means that people have got to shift resources from other parts which aren't growing, and that's not an easy thing to do in a big institution. Okay. I, I think that's probably the most important thing, the community that's been created. Like I said, a whole, a whole scope of new scope of medical practice has arisen from a community that was developed out of a small university qualification. That's quite significant. Rural health is, is, is trying to find out what it should look like in the future within the university. Australian universities have created separate schools of rural health. That's pretty much standard amongst those universities now in Australia and also in Canada. Um, and that's a way of delivering the particular sorts of structures and things that are needed for people who are off campus and in those areas. Um, and, and Otago's trying to work out whether or not it should do this in the future. If it doesn't, then Waikato's going to do it quite quickly, as you can see from the news recently. There is the pressure out there from the sector for it to happen. Yeah. Let's go through these. I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish off. Like I said, I want a couple of minutes. So I think, in, in, in summary, I think what, we do, what we're doing is very important for the university with respect to its social accountability mandate, its responsibility to generate a, um, a health workforce for all of New Zealand. I think it's very important when it comes to that. And I think it's also what we do is relatively important with respect to um, the desire of the university to, to engage communities, and particularly rural communities. Um, but it is still... Oops, it is still a university that sells itself around its bricks and mortar. Um, and, I, and that's where the, the tension and the challenges lie just a little bit. Okay. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, do we have some questions or comments? Gordon, mm -hmm. hang on. You mentioned tensions with other providers, I think, but have you had any tensions with the college? No, no, we haven't. Because um, it's been, and that's been an interesting journey, I think, with the college. And there's a couple of college, so I might ask Lita and things if she, if she wishes to, 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 to respond. Yeah. Yeah, you, you should answer that, Lita, yeah. Yeah, no, it has been a really interesting journey. Um, and it's been great having the foundation work that um, Gary and the team have already done. And so um, from my side, it is the administrative side and getting to know the, the um, providing the clinical side um, support that way. So, um, but also they've opened new doors with the Cook Islands and potentially the Pacific on, as a whole, um, which will be exciting in the, in the near future. Just a very mundane question. So some of your Pacific Island students will pay New Zealand fees, but some of the Pacific Islanders will be charged international fees by the university, is that the case? Yeah, that's, that, that's a little bit of a challenge. Now, for if they're um, citizens of the Cook Islands, then they don't pay international yeah. fees. Yeah. Um, but then that, there has been an arrangement, which I don't fully understand, involving higher parts of the university, I think using some trust funds, which has helped with some of the international fees for some of the Cook Islands doctors who aren't Cook Islands residents. So I think generally they pay, they've been paying New Zealand sorts of fees. That, it's going to be more of an issue with respect to Tonga and, Tonga. and Samoa. Um, but their, um, the Ministry of Health is is driving this process, so I suspect that they will be paying the fees for those doctors. Yeah. Carol. Kia ora, Gary. Carol here. Now, I'm speaking as an ex-West Coaster and a very proud one. But when you were showing that map, I did notice that there was a large gap, specifically in the South Westland area, 
where there was no coverage. Now, again, talking as coaster, uh, the distances between South Westland Fieldland and the nearest general hospital is Greymouth, and the distance required to travel is considerable. Now, I just wondered if any of the students had planned to do residentials down that way or perhaps will do in the future so that the uh, that area can have some form of coverage. It, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very aware of the issues, particularly with the south part of the coast, because um, there is, particularly if people are right at the south part of the coast, then they're actually quite likely to come to Dunstan, where I work, rather than go to Greymouth, because you know, right down the house, we're actually um, but closer to them than, than, than Greymouth is even. Um, and, and sometimes if someone's coming from um, Haast and sick enough to require hospital admission, you know, it's not unusual for them to turn up the next day, let alone that day. Um, so so those, there's definitely those, those difficulties. There, there are, um, on papers right at the moment, there are no, because uh, there are only two doctors who are based um, in Whataraua or further south. Um, right at the moment, they're not on the paper, but uh, last year actually one of them was, and the year before that two of them were. So we have, we have had a reasonable tie-in with, with South Westland. Yep. Yeah. They still have a primary health nurse down that they used to. Yes, they do. Yep. So there's two doctors who sort of cover the entire area, and then there is a nurse in each of the glacier towns, Whadaroa and Haast. Anybody else? I, what always impresses me when I hear about your program and the things that you do is your um, solid emphasis on things that you're trying to contribute beyond the program. You know, the development of communities and making that link and um, reaching out to people who don't have access normally to, to these sorts of um, programs and opportunities. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a great program and uh, uh, from my perspective it's, it's, really, uh, it's really admirable that you continue to, to push it and make sure it happens and it's astonishing how big it's becoming. Mm. So thank you very much Gary for coming thank along. You. <laughs>